I think I think we're live now. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Guess what, you guys? This is the Deaf Chicks, and we are at our 30th show. I cannot believe it. So what I wanted to do is tell you that Deaf Chicks is a collaboration between Misty Lynn, my wonderful co-host um, from Better, BetterSweetBlessing.com, and myself, Patty Burgess from TeachingTransitions.com and DoingDeathDifferently.com. And for do oh, I'm hearing. Okay, now I'm hearing an echo and I'm hearing myself repeat. <laughs> so I don't know what to do about that. Um, Patty, it, it might be if you have a Crowdcast link, because we also broadcast via Crowdcast. So if you have that up and open, it may be broadcasting live. And if both okay. are on at the same time, then, then that can create that. All right. Let me, let me see if I can change that. I think that's better. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Sounds fine on my end. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it is repeating. You know what? I may jump out. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to okay, jump so, out. Uh, in just a you little go bit. ahead and jump out. We, if this is your first time joining us, or if you're a, a long time viewer, we're the Death Chicks. Uh, we're here because Patty and I really, and all, all of our guests, we, we really feel a need to open the world's minds and hearts up to the fact that we're all going to die. And uh, if you're joining us for a first time, that might sound morbid because this is how we're brought up, that we don't speak about death, dying, grief, and loss. When we hear these words, our bodies kind of uh, naturally, it, it, well, because of what we're taught, uh, constrict. And we figure it's high time to, to change things. Um, our, our guest today, Jane Duncan Rogers, has such a lovely story and I had the pleasure of meeting Jane in person last year about this time and I am truly amazed at how far she's come and and also the internal stamina that it takes to not only lose your husband um, but to write a book about it and 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 then to, to share this with the world and the surprising part for me, and, and perhaps not surprising, but um, what inspires me about Jane is that when I met her last year, uh, I knew she'd lost her husband. I knew she had started a book, but she, she was really sitting on the fence. She, she was thinking about maybe sharing it, but she wasn't really sure. And, and here she is now. She's a best-selling international author on Amazon. She just released her book, Gifted by Grief, A True Story of Cancer, Loss, and Rebirth, that was released only last month. Um, she's affecting so many lives by this book. And I've read her book, and it's brilliant. Even I was, no one wants to read a book and, and feel down in the dumps, but Jane's book is truly inspiring. And it's much more than a book on grief and loss. So Jane, like us, she wants to enable a world where grief, dying, and death are considered a natural and normal, and nourishing even, I love this word she uses, a nourishing part of the conversation. Jane was so inspired by the awakenings of what happened to her after her husband died in 2011 that she created this book. She, she shared uh, what happened to her, and one of the brilliant parts of the book is that she takes excerpts from her journal. So this isn't uh, someone who remembered what happened and wrote it down. There's actual excerpts from her journal in her book, and they're, they're raw, they're heartfelt, and they're so honest. It's lovely. Um, a little bit more about Jane, and then we'll launch right in. Jane's past is that she works. she's worked in the field of psychology and personal growth for most of her life. She now helps clients to find their own gifts in their situation of loss. Um, when I met Jane previous to her uh, starting on this, she was a business coach. So she has a lot of experience under her belt and she's um, been very brave to come forward with this in, in this way. Uh, she's also known for her wild wisdom. 
which she brings to everything she does, and you'll you'll you can feel that with her delightful smile. And on a personal note, uh, Jane gains great inspiration from walking in nature, and this comes through in her book, from Latin dancing, and from singing in an a cappella group. So without further ado, uh, Jane Duncan Rogers, we're so deeply pleased to have you join us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's so lovely to see you again, both of you. Hey, Jane. Yes, I'm back. I'm back. I made it. I don't know what happened, but thanks so much for being here. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. We're thrilled to have you. So um, we, we know, you know, Gifted by Grief is your book and it is your journey. Can you kind of take us to the beginning of that and uh, share with us why you even decided to take this very personal experience and create a book for the rest of us. Sure. Well, I kind of knew that I would always write about this because I've been I've I've written in my journal since I was a teenager. Um, I like writing anyway. I've written a blog for the last few years, so a regular weekly blog. So writing is is uh, come second nature if you like. So I kind of wasn't surprised when um, it, well that's not quite true to say that. I kind of I knew that I would be writing about it. What I didn't know was the form that it exactly would take. And the first thing that happened was I was away on holiday in May last year and I um, wasn't very well. I had to spend about three days in bed and what came to mind was to create a mind map of what this book might look like. I didn't have any notes or any of my journals or anything there with me, so I didn't um, I didn't go into it in huge detail. And then when I got home, I, I didn't start writing, and that, that that really surprised me. I thought that I was ready to roll, you know, but I knew enough mm -hmm. to wait. I knew enough to just wait because I thought the muse would take me or something would happen. And I was right because just a couple of months later, again on holiday. I um, woke up one morning and I just thought, oh my goodness, this is the time I have to write now. And I was due home in a couple of days' time and, and I just rearranged my schedule. I started uh, to, I, I arranged it so that I could go to med meditation in the morning to a sanctuary near here. I would come home, get my breakfast, and then I would be writing between 8 and 10, minimum, but definitely 8 till 10. And I didn't look at any emails, I didn't look at any Facebook, and that was really hard. It was really hard. <laughs> I, I, I tried to do the same thing. That is not easy. <laughs> it's not easy, but mm -hmm. I was so proud of myself when I did it, because in a way, doing the writing, and, and, and actually that time, it might have... It was often writing, but it was sometimes doing research. I had to go back through my journals. I knew that I wanted to put in journal entries, and I knew that I wanted to put in entries from Philip's blog um, that he wrote in his last year of his life. So I had to go back and look at those, and that was not easy, actually. And I, I had to allow time. This was just not an ordinary book. I had to allow time for mm -hmm. the re-grieving, if you like. You know, there were quite a lot of tears. What was surprising mm -hmm. was you, you said, Misty, about the journal entries being raw. And actually, that surprised me as well when I went back to look at them. So this was, you know, two, mm -hmm. two and a half years on. I'd forgotten that I felt like that. I had forgotten about the intensity of it, which was amazing. So, yeah, that's and where really, I got Jane. To. You know, I think that I think that in itself was really. That's why I think I haven't read many books on grief, but I think this is what makes your book stand out a bit because it's not thinking back, which our, our memory always plays with things. Um, but this is ta what you're feeling at the exact time. Yeah. And it, it's so beautiful, and I, I think people can really relate to it who are going through grief because it is so raw. And and I know you, Jade. And you're when I first met you, you seemed like a just a very composed and polite and wonderful, decent woman. But you know, there's these nasty swear words that come out like, "Fuck! Why is this happening?" And uh, and it's so it's so honest. It's so dead honest. And it's I think everyone goes there when they're when they're feeling really deeply. But yeah, it does it does sound better, Jane, with an accent. It really does. I'm, I'm <laughs> although I'm sure that we 
that we sound like we've got the accent. So <laughs> that's okay. Well, there was a lot more swear words in the actual journals, I can tell you. <laughs> 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 well, good for you to have the courage to share, and uh, people, you know, people need to see, hear what's real. And we're, you know, we're not, we're not coating it things with sugar here. This is this is what it's about, and and you you're teaching us that it's it's bad and it's harsh and it's deep and it's all that it is. But there's a richness to there too, and and there's a there's a, a sweetness amongst the bitter. I remember, you know, what I remember, I remember thinking the the one thing that I knew about all these different feelings and there was a lot of different feelings going on mm -hmm. um, I, I particularly felt very angry and I had lots of tears I didn't have so much fear I know lots of other people have a mm -hmm. lot of fear that wasn't the case for me but I did know that I needed to just let those feelings be felt that was one thing that I was willing to do and that I knew was important. I don't think I really thought about why it was important. I just knew from my experience of life that this was an important thing to happen. And uh, and so there they are. They all poured out. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, like I love what you said, Precious. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Patty. Um, I just want to bring up something Jane said pre-show that I really thought hit home because this is something I say with my clients over and over again in many different ways but Jane said it beautifully she said what was it now um, when the feelings knock are knocking at the door you have to open it mm. yeah I explained that to myself by imagining, uh, um, I realized that the feelings were coming knocking at the door. These were feelings that I didn't really want and they were not very pleasant feelings. But if I did what I wanted to do, which was, you know, lock the door and pull down the blinds and all that, they were just going to get more insistent. And so actually what I did in effect was um, welcome them in. And at the same time, I, using the, the house analogy, I kept the back door open so that they could come in and they could be here for as long as they needed to be here, but they could easily leave as well. And that actually is what I found. It, it, it sometimes went on for a lot longer than I thought it ought to. <laughs> but really great I didn't visual, all... Jane. Really great yeah. visual because I think so many people feel like when they answer that door, to use your metaphor, that uh, now they've got a guest in their house for life that won't leave. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, by almost energet by opening that, energetically opening that back door, it's sort of a flow through, you know, yeah. almost like the feng shui of feelings or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a really good way of describing it. And and that is what I found. So, you know, you, you do have to have the courage to open that door in the first place. But I, and I suppose I did that when I was saying to myself, I'm just going to let myself feel and it doesn't matter where I am and it doesn't matter what I'm feeling, I'm just going to let it happen. Um, which led to, you know, some tears in some rather unusual places but that's okay <laughs> uh, and I, and I want to make a point there because I think that's the the part the bravery the courage the the place where it all kind of comes together because those are the places where most will shut the door and will keep you know and, and then you get that visual that people talk about is that beach ball trying to hold that underneath the ocean yeah. and um, it eventually it will have its way with you so you might as well be in control and let it have its way with you when you've invited it versus when you haven't yeah. um, so mm -hmm. I, I just think that's like a, a, a really big tipping point um, and it's a very hard thing to do to allow just this intense negativity into your being and into your bones mm -hmm. but in doing so it kind of transmutes does it not like it just sort of it's, it's like a metamorphosis then it can't it can't oh. stay in the same panic state no it can't it can't it, it does transmute and it does change and we get stuck when you try not to have it that was how it happened for me anyway you know, I knew this stuff intellectually. I had learned it professionally. I had applied it to a certain degree in my life anyway. But I had never before felt the intensity of the feelings that I did feel. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't every minute of every day, but it was like in waves. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always sometimes. And another thing that confused me, that was right, it was sometimes I felt 
I can remember going out for a walk one day and feeling amazingly happy. Mm. And I couldn't understand this. This was about a week after Philip had died. And I was going home to an empty house. I couldn't understand it. But in that moment, and it lasted maybe five minutes or so, I really felt mm. incredibly happy inside. That was very confusing, I can tell you. But I allowed that feeling in as much as the other ones. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I... Many women who've lost their husbands who feel such a guilt when they feel happy because, you know, I'm not supposed to feel happy. I just um, lost my husband. And I love how you also let that one in. And there was a, a famous quote by um, some ancient philosopher, you know, the, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm. And w with your story, Jane, I think you've examined the loss of your husband much more deeply than many women allow themselves to uh, and or that you know it's it's a bit you've kind of taken it a step farther so you've you've really looked at what's happened and uh, your story to me shows us the, the brilliance and the beauty that can emerge when we do look into our dark when we do dance with the darkness instead of running from it or hiding from it or uh, doing all those things to turn against it, but when we turn and face and embrace, um, uh, you know, everyone just has to look at you and where you are now to see the benefits of that. Um, you know, to your point, Misty, that's really interesting, Jane, and, and I, I do want you to address that, but in addition to that examination, it also seems that it leads to a place of no bitterness, whereas I think when sometimes we stop short, of examination, it's where those bitter and fe uh, bitter feelings and how could this happen and why did this happen can get stuck without that examination. Mm -hmm. the, there's not that option. Yeah, I think you're right about that, and it's interesting about bitterness. I would say that I never felt bitter about it. I did feel very angry indeed that Philip had not. Well, for, I, I would have a conversation in my head like this. I'd be furious with him for not taking care of me financially, you know, like he should have done. And then, because I'm quite honest with myself, the next thing would be, but hang on a minute, Jane, you didn't take care of it either, you know. So then I was back in just feeling angry that he wasn't here and that I couldn't share with him what was going through my mind at that time. That was one really difficult thing because we used to talk and share everything. Um, and... But I think also, I was, um, you know, at the moment when he died, because I was there with him when he died, it, it happened so um, quickly that he was no longer his body, mm. and I, all I saw was this empty, I described it as an empty bag lying on the hospital bed, you know, and it was really strong that but why would I want to have anything to do with this empty bag hmm. when it wasn't him? You know, so I, as he had been coming to the having no breaths at all, I was saying to him, I was speaking to him, you know, welcome, you know, talking about love and angels. And I can't remember what I was saying now, but anyway. And I had to turn my head up to the ceiling and start to talk to the ceiling because it wasn't him lying there. And, and that kind of propelled me on a mission to discover what it was that was that lives in this bag here you know this is a this is a, a filled bag if you like so is that one and that one <laughs> mine's filled a little bit more than I would like it to be sometimes, so. <laughs> personally but <laughs> well you know um, I think I've been a spiritual seeker all my life and here I was my god was I I was like what is this? What is this life thing that we talk about? Life force. We call it life force. I didn't know. I really wanted to know what that was. And that, in a way, that provided a, a kind of strong thread through all of the feelings. It didn't take away anything from the feelings. The feelings were always still there. But trying to come to terms with what it all was, that, I think, looking back now, that was helpful for me. You know what, yeah. too, it, it, and that, to, oh, I'm sorry, Missy, I, I was going to say, I had this conversation with my friend this morning who I got some information about from a medical scenario, and it seems like to me that you have this ability, 
uh, and I think it's a wonderful ability to be the observer and the participant at the same time. You are experiencing mm -hmm. all of this. You're experiencing the, the pain, the hurt, the confusion, the, the why of it, yet you're able to observe what's happening. And I think mm -hmm. that you know, some people might call that schizophrenic, but I, you know, split. But I call it beauty because yeah. It, it, yeah. there's a guidance system there. There's a guidance yeah. system that helps mm -hmm. get you through. Would you say that you had that ability throughout the experience? I definitely had that going on, mm -hmm. and partly it was because mm -hmm. I was um, accessing um, something that I call the listening. The the listening mm -hmm. is an inner voice that I had been uh, had heard many many years previously um, when I had been out for a walk and railing at God for the fact that we couldn't have children that's a whole other story but anyway and in that moment I um, I heard a voice telling me that it was not my path to have children in this life it was to um, to have a purely focused spiritual life and not be distracted from anything and it was so strong that I I almost looked round to see who had said it, but it, it wasn't that. It was something happening inside. I don't know exactly what it was, but over time, that developed to the point where I could just sit down and with my journal and a pen, and I didn't, well, uh, this took a little bit of practice, but after a while, I would just be accessing this voice, which seemed to come from behind here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know what words it was saying until they were down on the paper. And um, that they were always unfailingly, incredibly loving. And mm. it was, that really helped. And actually, I can remember yeah. saying that in the week before he died, I said to him, how am I going to manage without you? And he, he was quite practical. He said, you'll be fine. You've got the listening. Well, you know, at that moment in time, I didn't really appreciate that, but he was right. <laughs> Indeed. And, and Jane, that comes through so loudly in your book, the listening, I would I would just relish. Every time the listening's through, you, you, really there's a sense that, that you are speaking to God or whatever that higher higher power is that um, speaks through you and, and or to you, and you know it's the voice of truth. And, and uh, what Patty commented about you experiencing it, and then you also being the observer, which is a trait that that I aspire to, is to always be, you know, living my life yet observing my life. And uh, it, that that I think also lends to the brilliance of your book, and that it, um, you do, you dive deeper in your book. It's not about you know the grief it's about well I think grief and, and major loss brings us to ask these questions what why am I here you know what what is God who is God so these deeper questions are really explored and in, in um in the raw and um, engaging manner that we spoke of before and uh, yeah I, I can't say enough about uh, about the richness of your book um, one thing, just to, to bring us back around to a little bit more practical, um, mm. there's another thing that was very interesting in, in the book, and that was the list. Yeah. And um, and this this is the more practical side of the book. And you know, if if you're in the position where a loved one is dying, the the list I think was was very helpful in in your case, Jane. Would you like to speak about that? Sure. Yes, this was, um, we had a friend, a very close friend, um, who emailed in, I can't remember exactly when it was, a few, as it was, as it turned out, a few month, uh, months before Philip died. And she emailed a list of questions that she thought that we really needed to address before Philip died. Now, remember, at this point, we didn't know when he was going to die. We just you, you don't know until it happens. <laughs> so we were a bit reluctant. We, you know, I could see that they were useful because there were lots of very practical things, um, not just about the will and all sorts of things like that, not just about um, what you want to have, uh, how you want to have your um, actual death taken care of, but all sorts of things like, I'm just going to look at it here right now, um, I put it in the back of my book. Um, Things like, who would you like to have around you in your last days? Or, for example, going 
are there things in your personal items that you don't actually want people to look at after you have died? You need to take care of them now, that sort of thing. Um, do Does your uh, loved one or anybody left after you have died, do they know what your username and passwords are and what to do about any online presence you have? Um, anyway, we didn't... Um, I knew it was a really good idea to do this because I knew my life would be made a lot easier if we could do this. So I did um, um, one Saturday morning. It was <laughs> in bed. We hadn't we hadn't gone to the hospital yet. He had. We were still at home, and um, I was lying there beside him in the bed with the laptop. And I said, "We're going to do the list now," and that is what we did. We created his list, and it meant asking him questions like, um, uh, "What kind of coffin do you want?" It's quite a difficult question to ask somebody when you know that they are going to die, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> He said to me, any old box will do. <laughs> so he was very mm. practical, as, as well as I was. And the most amazing thing about this was that, you know, we were quite good at working on projects together. We had renovated a lot of houses together. We worked together quite a lot. He was also a psychotherapist, so we were interested in the same things. Mm. And at the end of that morning, having c completed the list for him, we really felt like we had been working on a project together. It was it was wonderful. We were brought so mm -hmm. close together. So it actually became, um, it, it was a very enjoyable experience, although the topic was a bit mm -hmm. macabre. <laughs> that, yeah. You know, Jane, that really speaks loudly to um, exactly what we're talking about. The things that are hardest for us, the things that we want to run from, the things that we don't want to do, when we dive into them and actually do them, it's so richly rewarding. Yeah. And uh, I, I just want to take a moment to um, uh, say a shout out to our, our viewers and a, kudos to, to Patty and I after the, the blur, blur of having to recreate this change. We have successfully <laughs> uh, been able to get a number of viewers. So I just want to say hi, Catherine Holland. Nice to see you here. Glad you found us. Rachel Jordan, thank you again. Um, uh, relatively new to the Death Chicks, hoping to connect with you, Rachel. Um, Kim Adams, which is, I think, Kim, Patty, is Kim our guest next week? Yes, Kim I, is our I, guest I know next we've week. Been, there's lots going on, so we're looking forward to having Kim with us next week, which yep. I believe is a yep. grief and loss coach. Um, yep. June Como, I, I think that's a new viewer. Welcome, June. Heidi, thank you for joining us. Heidi has been with us since the beginning. Scott, Hi, very good to see you here, Scott. Another another supporter and helped us along the way. Um, and then there's there's two things I'd like to uh, just show to our audience. June, June commented on the listening. The listening sounds so powerful. We should all learn to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe if you feel compelled to speak more to that or. Um, if, if not now, uh, just so everyone knows, the comment stream on this Hangout, so if you use the link and come to this Hangout, this Hangout is here forever in time and we can continue the conversations here. So it is a it is an area to, um, Jane, if you have time after the show, if you want to engage with the listeners, that's an option. Mm -hmm. And um, I like this one, for this question from Scott. Um, Jane, uh, is skillful grief a learned behavior? If so, what role does experience play as opposed to so-called book learning? Good question. Nice question. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that I really benefited from the years and years and years of personal growth workshops that I'd been on, of psychotherapeutic training, and um, of a relatively high level of communication skill. I think I knew my, uh, uh, relatively speaking, I think I'm quite emotionally intelligent, and I was able to bring all that to the grieving. So from that point of view, I think um, it is something that you um, learn through life. Your life experiences will help you with whatever grief you're feeling. You know, you can read things in a book and you can you can resonate with them and you can learn them, but 
um, that isn't necessarily going to make any difference when some kind of loss happens. It may do, but I had never had any major loss happen to me before this. I, I, it just hadn't happened, you know. I had had other kinds of losses, but not, uh, not certainly not a death, and not a death of anybody so close. I had no idea how I was going to handle it. But I, it, looking back, I think that, and also I was surrounded by a lot of friends of a, a lot of other good quality friends. No, I never had anybody tell me that um, I had been breathing long enough, say after six months or something like that. In fact, even after two years, they were telling me this is it's still relatively new, you know. But and yet I hear that on some of the forums that I on, I hear I hear other people saying how they have been they they have not been met in their grief you know it's as if and that's really and I think this is the same for you guys it's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book and show it what it show it how it is at least how it was for me because we're not we're not comfortable with this in a society in our society you know we don't know how to be around people who are grieving and and so people do odd things like ignore you in the street or um, make silly, I think, silly comments like um, comparing um, a physical death to a divorce. Yes, they're both lost situations, but you can't compare them. It doesn't work like that. And yet I've heard, that, and even though these things didn't happen for me, that I he heard them happening for other people. Um, so we really need to be educated about... Um, about this and if I can um, I don't know that I would call my book a book learning because <laughs> I associate book learning with academic learning right. and uh, I don't think mm -hmm. my book is definitely not an academic book <laughs> well a personal journey I know I've, I've heard I probably said it before I've heard that that uh, statement or the comment that if you for example if you're going to a dentist uh, and you want to know what it's going to be like to have a tooth drilled, are you going to ask the dentist or are you going to ask somebody that just had a tooth drilled? You know, you're know, you going to ask the person who had the experience for what that's really like yeah. um, and the dentist can tell you all the technical parts. It all matters, it all comes together but it's how I think we integrate our, our own experience and you know it's interesting um, Jane I think that and I could be wrong about this but I wonder if because you were not the recipient of some really odd comments about grief um, was because you might have been even comfortable in your own skin with this grief because you had made a pact with it so to speak that you were going to let it in you were going to let it swirl around you and be with you so that when you got out there with your friends or people um, you might not have been awkward with it so that yeah. maybe they were not awkward with it because I, I think so many people who don't have the the wherewithal to really uh, grieve in a, in a way that serves them because I think there's healthy grief and maybe unhealthy to some degree uh, and then it gets awkward people don't know what to say or it seemingly takes too long or any of those things so yeah th yeah that could be true yeah I think you've got a good point there and it's you know, uh, I did have one or two people who were awkward. They were definitely okay. awkward, but I didn't take it personally. I just recognised yeah. yeah. that they were, they were uncomfortable. And in that moment, my job actually was to make them feel as comfortable as possible by not taking it personally and not getting upset myself. Um, mm -hmm. So it didn't affect me in that way. And. Um, but I think, in a way, in my book, I do remember a little bit where I made a comment, and it's not very often that I've said this, but um, where I directly say in the book, you know, um, even if you just say to someone, I don't know what to say, that in itself is a really truthful comment because we don't really know what to say because you never know how somebody is going to be affected by grief because it, it takes everybody in different ways and, and it, at different time periods as well so um, 
Yeah, that, I can remember when I wrote that, I'm thinking, mm, this is a very direct message I'm giving to my readers here. Well, that's okay. <laughs> that's what I want <laughs> them to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and I remember... I remember reading that and thinking, well, yes, because when someone's in a really deep feeling space, um, I sense they're closer to, to truth and honesty. And when they receive uh, truth and honesty from people around them, it, it hits home much better than um, you know trying to fake it or say something that you think might be nice. But I think you noticed I'm I'm sorry, I don't know what to say is. Is, is kind of a brave thing to say and it, it I think it would cr lessen the gap and I think it would create a, a connection, a human yeah, connection. Yeah, and, and, and also, you know, I've recognized, I mean, because around, since this, since this time, around me, other people have died, Not nobody nearly as close, but, um, mm -hmm. so I've been around people who have been grieving and I can feel a reluctance in me, especially if I don't know them that well, but I can feel a reluctance in me to acknowledge it. But because of what I've been through, I make myself acknowledge it in some way. You know, I just do it, it whether it's a card or um, an email or um, saying something if I'm coming to them face to face. It doesn't matter if I feel awkward. What matters is that that person is met and held just for that moment, even maybe just a couple of seconds or something. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. That's lovely because I think that's, I think that's what we all want is to be understood, even if it's only for a moment, exactly. to um, be met where we are, even if that's not where the rest of the world is at the moment. Yeah. So, I think that's a, a lovely thing to do, and that sounds like from one to another who has been there. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 I do, Jane, I do, you know it's. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Patty. No, I was gonna say I, I do have a, a question about that shift that happened for you when you uh, finally realized that peace had come after yeah. you know a long time. I wonder if you could speak about that just for a minute. Yeah. Now you know, as far as I'm concerned, that is the biggest gift that Philip could ever possibly have given me ever. Oh, um, wonderful. It, it was, you know, I said earlier on that I had always been a spiritual seeker and now I was really seeking with a vengeance to find out <laughs> what on earth is this thing that makes us alive, you know. And um, I had an experience in a workshop where I was, I was it was just, it was um, a, a workshop called The Elusive Obvious, which I love that title. I just thought, oh yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> and I, um, but I didn't like what the what the workshop leader was saying at the moment at the time. I could I can remember thinking this. He was saying something, and I really didn't like it. I was feeling very uncomfortable. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I can remember saying to myself, "It's okay, Jane. Just calm down. Just breathe. Think of the light." I used to use a white light image to help soothe me, and that's what I was doing. And then suddenly there was this kind of flip, and. I realized there is no me and a white light, I am the white light. And it was quite extraordinary. And I looked at everything for the next two days through completely different eyes. And I didn't really understand what had happened. <laughs> Something had happened for sure. Didn't really understand what had happened. And then everything kind of, uh, and then I described it as the fog rolled in again, it really was like that, the fog rolled in again over me being this light and it became a, yet another experience that I'd had which was wonderful, I'd had quite a lot of spiritual awakening experiences, this was obviously another one, even though it lasted for two days, that was the longest, that was nice. <laughs> and then about a year later, um, a similar thing happened and I was just walking down the driveway at one point um, and I, this time I was thinking about peace and I suddenly realized oh yeah but I am peace. Now I know that doesn't sound very momentous but mm -hmm. this time no fog rolled in and I now look back and I see 
okay, I've always been a person who has been able to sink down into a place of peace, who's able be, been able to find a white light or something soothing and, find, and be calmed by that mm -hmm. and uh, find it very nourishing. And that's been fine and there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's wonderful. And yet now what's happened, it's, it's the other way around. I, who I am, this I, if you like, is is this place of peace that sometimes is um, in having an emotional story of some kind is being a person in this world. This is quite difficult to talk about, and it's new for me to talk about it. I've never talked about it before now. Other than and now, you're the, out. Now you're out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. Yes. But it's good. It's good because obviously we're. We're, we're here to listen and take in. You've been there, and we, we want to hear. We want to hear. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I think the thing that is different is that I'm, and I'm, and when this happened, I realized what had been going on in the very first few months after Philip had died. I was aware. I didn't, I didn't understand it at the time, but I was aware that at the same time as feeling these really strong emotions of tears and rage and all the rest of it, there was something else going on underneath that was constant, and it was... It wasn't an emotion, it was just some constant, calm, um, non-judgmental um, sense of, I don't know what. Is it kind of like a knowing, like a, a place of, of deep knowing, no matter what's going on in the chaos, you were going to be okay? Kind of like that, except it wasn't, um, it was more just a sense of peace. And it was the kind of quality of peace that had never it had never started, it was never going to end, it's just there constantly. Mm -hmm. And when this sort of shift thing happened, I realized that that's what I had been feeling all along. So that is, and that now, I believe, that is who we really are. That is who you are, that is who you are, mm -hmm. Patty, as well. And it's, um, we all are that, actually. And then... Mm -hmm. We have a layer on top, which is called uh, our human story, in whatever way that pans out. Oh yeah. But I've recognised, um, you know, the benefits of of this is that I um, live life at a much more, um, much less highs and lows. Now, in my twenties, I used to love having highs and lows, but I'm not so keen on them now. I like a bit of equilibrium. <laughs> And Your offense is a little overrated, isn't it? <laughs> I know exactly. So I don't. Ha it just doesn't happen so much. I don't react to things so much, and um, I'm still kind of exploring this. Okay, but it is. Um, you know, I also like the idea of being peace. It's just mm. <laughs> being peace, okay, not even having amazing. it. Being that is peace. amazing. Yeah, and. Uh, I sense that, you know, I sense that. I, I've also had that experience. Um, very difficult to describe, but you've described it well. And, um, you know, we're not, uh, who, I don't know who said, we're, we're not our brain, we're not our body, we're not our story. Mm. We simply are, and we are yeah. peace, we are light, we are love, whatever you want to put there. But it's, um, it's a beautiful thing when we can move beyond what we think we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, uh, and you know that, and that's why, really, in the end, I called my book "Gifted by Grief" because I, it, I, I felt like, in Philip dying, he had given me this huge gift, which is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the best gift I could possibly ever have. And yeah, I'm so blessed. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're so, so very thrilled that you have chosen to share some of your very personal stories, some of your very personal journal entries with us. And um, I think the the world is all the better for it because the more people that are learning from, who are learning from others' experience who've been there. As I said, I think um, in the intro to this show that you are really like a guide, a way shower. And uh, to let people know that they can come through and they can come through with glory and beauty and peace and all the things they had hoped for but never thought they could have. So thank you so, so much. Um, 
I, I think here we are at uh, 45 uh, of, and um, mm -hmm. what we'd like to do, what we normally like to do to start to close this out, um, what a wonderful uh, experience today, Jane, is that we go around and share what's happening uh, in each other's worlds, and um, Missy, if you want to start us up, Jane will end with you so that you can make sure you tell us where to get your book, and okay. Okay. anything else you want to let us know that's going on. Okay, fine. <laughs> Sure. Um, what can I share today? Okay, um, I have something that I want. To, oh, well, that's not working. Um, okay, Patty, just give me a minute. I'm just going to check something. And, okay. Uh, Sounds good. I will, oh, you're checking a link for your, you, your information. You go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. So, um, teachingtransitions.com is one of my sites, and that is for hospices and colleges. That's more of... Um, that side of the business and we do offer training for hospice volunteers, for uh, family caregivers and for um, referral sources that the hospices are working for. We want to make sure that everybody involved in that delivery of a very important service is trained and trained well. And on the other side is doingdeathdifferently.com. DoingDeathDifferently.com is for individuals, for those who are drawn to be with the dying. Um, that could be from grief co coaches and grief specialists and mental health professionals or just a personal caregiver who is facing this uh, end of life scenario with a loved one. Um, so if you were to go to any of those sites, you would get some information. But on the doing death differently side, doing death differently .com side, that, as I say, is for individuals and uh, uh, lots of good stuff on there, like the 134 ways we talk about dying when we say we're not, and uh, in everyday <laughs> language, all sorts of good stuff there that maybe you can add to. So um, wonderful. You good to go, Mist? Are you next? Yeah, I think so. I've been uh, doing a little work on my website, and sometimes I can't keep up. But I'll just send people to um, whattodoandsay.com, and there's a little ebook there. And it's um, if you have someone who who is uh, who is dying, uh, just uh, it's, it's a little guidance, and it's it's a, it's comes from the heart. It's based on research from Institute of the Heart Math of HeartMath, uh, HeartMath.org, I think, and it, it's just, um, it's for those times when you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, and it will kind of bridge the gap, and uh, so what to do and say.com. Thanks everyone so much for joining us, and um, we'll pass it over to Jane to say goodbye before we head out for the day. Thank you. Well, my book, Gifted by Grief, you can get on Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk if you're listening in the UK. And um, you, But my website is giftedbygrief.com. And also, uh, I, I have a Facebook group. If you go to Facebook and put in Gifted by Grief, you'd be very welcome to join the Facebook group. And I'd also like to just ask if you have been, if anybody has been touched by the idea of the list and would like, would be interested in knowing more about that and actually compiling the list. You know, the list is in the back of the book, but I know how difficult it is to actually do that list. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking of putting together a group where we can actually support each other in getting that done. But I, I need to know if there's people out there who are interested. So you just would need to email me. Um, um, by going to giftedbygrief.com and contacting me in the contact box there and letting me know about that. That's a wonderful invitation mm -hmm. because if we're talking about people um, beginning to have those conversations as we're trying to foster here, um, mm -hmm. having you, I, I mean, I have this image of you in bed with a laptop asking your husband these questions, <laughs> and it doesn't have to be that way. No. It can be different, right? And. Yes. Uh, if there's anybody that can support somebody through those conversations, I know it's you, Jane. It's definitely yeah. you. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, we uh, this has been a long time in coming. We've known you for a while now, and um, your book is out, and another part of your journey has begun. So we're thrilled that uh, we can help uh, on that help along the way and let people know about this journey and this wonderful book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you are so Thank you. Very good, and and. 
Just to say goodbye, um, there's lots of people commenting, Lori, uh, viewer, Donna Bell, Rachel Jordan, and uh, just saying goodbye and thank you. Um, Sue Kual says, uh, the, the last comment, she said, I just received Jane's book in the mail today, today. divine timing, everyone, <laughs> and Jane, it's been a sincere pleasure, and we look forward to following your journey, and uh, please stay in touch and let us know if there's any way we can help you. So thank bye you. for now, everyone. We'll see you next All week. Right. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.